Right, so um, this subject, as Alfie's already said, is uh, the fig tree assigned for all time. And the reason that I thought I would do it today is because I only did it last Saturday at a youth weekend for Lapworth with about 80 children. Well, I'd say, yeah, there were children. They were aged 13 to 17. And because it was on my mind, I thought might, maybe it's a good time, you know, to do it for others as well as the, uh, the young people that were there last Saturday. Uh, there were three talks that I did at, uh, on Saturday for them. The first one was called The Fruit. The second one was called The Tree. And the third talk uh, was called The Future. Uh, but tonight, you'll be glad to know it's only one talk. And we're just going to look at the first talk that I gave on Saturday, which is The Fruit. And I thought I'd just start off by saying how this talk actually came about to start with because well I just found, found it a little bit interesting but um, what happened was last November uh, we were down in Cornwall it was my birthday on the day that we got down there and it happened to be the day that I caught Covid so we'd only been there what 24 hours haven't we and then we had to head all the way back up from Cornwall back here with the windows wide open so Angie didn't catch it and then, of course, uh, Angie ensured that I was in quarantine then for like days and days and days uh, with the door shut. I'm in the spare room upstairs. And I guess for the first few days, all I did was okay, slept or watched a bit of Netflix. And then after a couple of days, I thought to myself, this is a complete waste of my life and time. I'm starting to feel a little bit better. But I'm still not allowed outside the bedroom so I thought what can I do that's a bit more productive than just lying in bed feeling sorry for myself and for some reason I thought I would maybe look at the bible and maybe I don't often get time just to stop and think so I started praying to God because I didn't know what to to do it on and I was sleeping and praying and thinking and getting my computer out and in in the end I thought I know I'm going to look at the parable of the fig tree that Jesus told in Luke and then I was just about to start looking at that parable when I thought to myself well I remember hearing a long time ago that the best way of studying any subject is to go back to the first time that something's mentioned and so I went back to looking at figs and fig trees right the way through the Bible and ended up of course in in Genesis and I would think I must have spent at least 100 hours on on this. My The bed was covered in paper and the computer was full of notes. And I was finding out stuff that I never knew before about the fig tree. I read and read and read and read stuff about the fig tree and looked at the Bible. And eventually then I thought I'll put it all into slides. And so I created 128 PowerPoint slides on the back of that, all while I'm still with COVID. And then I went back to work and forgot about it. And then about three or four weeks after that, Mark Bateman phoned me up from Lapworth and said, Andy, the, do you want to do a youth weekend for us? Because your name's come up. And I said, yeah. And I thought, oh, I said, I've got four different subjects. Take your pick. And I wondered if you'd pick the fig tree. And lo and behold, that's the one they picked. So I thought, well, you know, that's good. We'll give it its first outing at the uh, at the youth weekend, which I did on Saturday. So that's the sort of history as to why this, why I put it together, really. And I suppose the, le the lesson from my point of view is that out of very horrible um, times, because uh, I didn't, COVID was pretty nasty for, for myself. I know others have had it a lot worse than I had it. You know, good things can come out of it because I'm telling you this now. If I didn't have, had, if I hadn't have had COVID, I would never ever have done this talk, or at least I can't think I would have done it because I wouldn't have had the time. So, with that little bit of background, uh, let's open the curtains and let's crack on with this talk, which is all about the fruit. So, the first thing that was sort of really interesting to me was that when you actually looked at the Bible and, of course, right the way through creation and through uh, the, the establishment of the kingdom and the, and the Jews coming back into Israel and then into the New Testament with the Gospels and the establishment of the, of the church and the meetings, the ecclesias, 
And in fact, right the way through into Revelation, what I found was the fig tree was just everywhere. And those are all the books in the Bible where figs and fig trees uh, are mentioned. Genesis, Deuteronomy, Judges, Psalms, Kings, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Amos, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Haggai, Zechariah, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, James and Revelation. So you think that is, an, you know, it's an incredible number. In fact, as it turns out, the fig tree and the fig are mentioned more than any other tree in the Bible by a considerable margin. Um, around about 200 times the fig tree and figs are mentioned. Uh, the olive tree is, is mentioned only a fraction of, of times. And I thought olive would have come out number one by you know, a long way, but it, it doesn't. The, the, the fig tree is way, way out in front. So that was sort of quite interesting that, that that was the case. And so the three talks, one was effectively looking at the fruit based on Genesis. The second talk was based on uh, the tree, which is looking at the kingdom of Israel. And the third talk was basically looking at all the references to the fig tree in the Gospels and also the references uh, to the future, because as it turns out, the fig tree effectively covers the whole plan and purpose of God in a lot of detail. So, as I say, tonight we're just going to be considering uh, the fruit. Now, one of the things I, when I started reading up about the fig tree, one of the things that came out that was really surprising to me was that it is a completely unique tree. In fact, if you got all the fruit trees in the world, and there's many, many different varieties of fruit trees, um, the fig tree would be on its own as a unique tree versus every single other tree that is, that's on planet Earth from a fruit point of view. And in fact, if you later on um, get the time, go onto Google, and type in this phrase, what makes a fig tree unique? Um, and you'll find that the answer comes up. This is still the number one answer that comes up when you type it into Google. It says, fig trees have no blossom on their branches. The blossom is inside the fruit. And this makes the fig tree completely unique because every single other fruit tree has blossoms on the branches, and from the blossoms come the fruit. And so I thought, well, that's pretty interesting that all of the fruit trees operate in a particular way apart from the fig tree. And then I uh, started swatting up about fruit and it says that fruit is an edible and usually sweet product of a plant or tree that contain, contains seeds. When the flower is pollinated, the ovary begins to grow and it becomes the fruit. So I thought, well, wait a minute, this, this is odd then, because if all the fruit trees have got um, a flower and the flower and the ovary becomes the fruit, what on earth is happening with the fig tree and why is it different and, and what's going on? And clearly it's an important tree from a biblical point of view, because it's mentioned all the time more than any other tree. So, yeah, so here we are. Here's, here's some figs. I don't know if you, when you last ate a fig. Um, I haven't eaten. In fact, I tried to buy the kids uh, a fig each, but you try getting hold of a fresh fig at the minute. It is absolutely not an impossible unless you, unless you want to spend a huge amount of money. So I gave them all a fig roll instead, which uh, were 45p from Asda's, which saved a lot of money. Um, but anyway, so as I've said, the fig tree is unique no blossoms on the branches. So I then said to myself, well, there must be some flowers somewhere because surely there's got to be some seeds, there's got to be some flowers, something's got to be pollinated. And it turns out, of course, that the flowers are on the inside of the fruit itself. This is again completely unique. So there are flowers, but they're hidden inside the fig. So then I thought to myself, well, that's sort of quite interesting, but how on earth do flowers on the inside of a fruit get pollinated? Because I can understand a, a bee or something like that pollinating a flower that you can see, but what 
and how would these little flowers get pollinated when they're wrapped tightly inside the fruit because things have to be pollinated if you if they haven't got seeds then the, the, that tree becomes extinct very very quickly so i'm going to show you a couple of videos now and when you're listening to these videos hopefully you can hear it really think about the language that they're using in in the videos but this is about to show you exactly how the fig gets pollinated now why isn't that playing uh, yeah. sorry about this depends on a bizarre creature it depends on a bizarre creature that you might have never even heard of the fig wasp this minuscule insect is just around two millimeters long the wasp's life cycle is deeply intertwined with the fig she knows that the only way to get into the fruit is through a tiny hole on the bottom she has to sacrifice her wings in order to get through the tight nozzle. But she won't mind, as she knows that she'll never fly again. Once inside, the strangler fig shuts the entrance to its fruit. Thus, the final act of the wasp's life is to lay her eggs in the cavity. After that, she will die in there. Over time, the flowers and the wasp eggs develop, and the fig transforms into a mature fruit. From so there you are, that's the first video. Have a look at this uh, next video. And so the pollen-laden wasp reaches an immature fig, but her journey is far from over. Ahead lies the greatest challenge of her brief life. Clawing and squeezing her way through the gate, her wings and antenna are ripped from her. She makes the ultimate sacrifice as the final push to enter bursts her abdomen. In an epic struggle between sacrifice and survival, the mother wasp crawls through the narrow labyrinth towards the inner chamber. She is wounded and weak, carrying only her eggs and the pollen gift from the former fig. If the wasp fails to pollinate the flowers, no seeds will ever develop. Fig fruits with no future are costly to the tree, so they will not receive an inflow of nutrients. If the wasp does not pollinate, the entire fig may be aborted. However, if she devotes herself to pollination as well as laying eggs, she ensures the fig will hold the promise of seeds. The tree will pump sugars and nutrients into the fig, securing the future of seeds and larvae alike. When they mature and leave, the fig will ripen, thus completing the cycle of mutual benefit. And just one more little video. The fig is not a fruit, but a hollow garden of flowers. A female fig wasp has laid her eggs and pollinated the flowers, which have now reached maturity. The fig is a nursery. It is cared for the future wasp by protecting them within its gut. So, uh, just to put it into perspective, by the way, um, the female that you can see there, the female fig wasp, is no more than two millimeters long. So it's not like the wasp that you'd see flying around in your garden. But when I actually played this video, um, already the kids had latched onto something. I don't know whether you've latched onto this, but when it talks about a wasp dying inside the fig, that's exactly what happens. And so effectively, and we'll get onto this uh, a bit later, um, in almost all of the figs that you eat is um, a decomposed dead wasp but it, it completely is decomposed because the fruit itself um, pumps some uh, phycin into uh, the wasp which completely dissolves it so you're not crunching on a, on a on a dead wasp but it's interesting that the kids instantly picked up on that but here's the here's the interesting thing right so I watched those videos many, many, many times and was thinking about it and dreaming about it in my COVID state. And it suddenly, I, what I did then was write down all the key phrases 
that came out of those videos that I've given you edited versions of. And here's the key phrases that you will have heard in those few videos. First of all, um, it talks about the fig being like an enclosed garden. Secondly, it said that there was only one and very narrow way into uh, this garden. There was talk about the ult the phrase was used, the ultimate sacrifice. I don't know whether you heard that as the wings were and antennae are torn off the fig wasp. And it, as it makes its way into the fig, it's no way out because the, 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 the door is closed effectively. The fig uh, automatically seals itself up when a fig wasp has gone in. Uh, the door is closed and therefore it's going to die uh, inside. You, you, you'd have heard the words, if you're listening carefully, that the, uh, the fig wasp was wounded and weak. Um, you'd have also heard the words that the fig wasp is devoted to pollination. You would have also heard these words as well, uh, the promise of seeds. So basically, the fig wasp is all about providing the promise of future seed. And the last thing that you'll have heard is that the future of the fig is secured. I've put of the fig in brackets there, but the future is secured or the future of the fig is secured because of the work of this tiny minuscule little fig wasp. So I was like staring at these uh, things thinking to myself this is these are quite amazing little phrases that none of these are by the way anything to do with Christian videos nothing whatsoever they're just fig wasp videos that on all sorts of different um, channels and I said to the children at the youth weekend I said does this ring any bells with any of you that if we weren't thinking about figs and fig wasps necessarily does do do these words on the right hand side take you to anywhere at all in the Bible? And about half a dozen hands go up and they said it sounds a bit like the Garden of Eden with a, an enclosed garden and uh, and sort of seeds and even perhaps mention of a fig. And I said, well, that's where my mind went. So my mind went into the Garden of Eden. In fact, the word garden in Hebrew means something that is enclosed. And uh, the phrase that, that, that was in the video was that a fig is like an enclosed garden. So here we are in, in, in the garden uh, of, of Eden that, that God made at the beginning. And what we're going to discover is that all of those things that we've just been uh, talking about, all of those key phrases in relation to the fig wasp, every last one of them are, are there in Genesis chapter 3 that Andy kindly read the first seven verses for us. Now, one of the key things that we know, of course, um, in the Garden of Eden is that, and this is, this is the centre of the story, of course, is that there was a tree of knowledge of good and evil that was in the centre of the garden and what we've just been reading about in Genesis chapter 3 is basically what happened reference the serpent the woman and Adam in relation to this particular tree so what we um, have read and I'll just read these words again I know we we know them so so well but in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, bearing in mind we're in an enclosed garden at, at this point, and we're looking for those other key phrases, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, then your eyes shall be opened and you will be as gods, knowing good and evil. So here we've got this, uh, we've got the woman uh, being deceived by the serpent because the serpent said, you shall not surely die. And we know that that was a, an absolute lie. 
Uh, by the way, of course, half of it was true and half of it was lies because their eyes were opened and they did understand good and evil at that point. But of course, the lie part was that you, you, you won't die. Now, of course, at that very point in time, it says that both of them uh, realized that they were naked. It says the eyes of both of them were open. They knew that they were naked. And here we've now got a reference to fig leaves because it says they sewed fig leaves together of all trees um, and made themselves aprons. So we've even got sort of a, a reference here to, to figs. But the other bit that we read about, which we haven't read uh, just now, of course, is the really key verse, um, probably at this point in the Bible, I would suggest, which is Genesis 3.15. And here now we've also got mention of seeds. Do you remember one of the quotes from the video? Still there, that's the question. Right, okay. Give me a moment. I will get the show back on the road. Are you all coping with this? Right, hold on a minute. Right. Bear with me. Yeah, the internet just literally just switched itself completely off. Right. Alfie, can you see that? Andy, can you see that? Give me a thumbs up. We're back on. Okay, right. So sorry about that little interlude. Uh, I'll see if I can um, still, uh, I don't know if it's still recording or what it's doing. I think it's still recording. Okay, so sorry about that. So I'll try and get my brain back into gear as to where we are. So yeah, so I was saying that God is talking to the serpent. I will put enmity, hatred between you, uh, Mr. Serpent, and the woman who's even between uh, your seed or your descendants, uh, Mr. Serpent, and the woman's seed or her descendants. It or he shall bruise thy head. Um, so in other words, the descendant of the woman is going to bruise the head of the serpent and you uh, or the descendant of the serpent is going to bruise his heel. So we've talked a lot about this verse in the past. We know what it actually means. So just putting it on the blackboard here, we know, of course, that the serpent was the really the original cause of sin and became symbolic of sin itself throughout the throughout the scriptures because it was the serpent that put the de uh, the deceptive thought into eve's mind he was tent he was testing eve and tempting eve and making her think things that were different to what god had said and uh, again, what we said with the children was, look, are we expecting the seed of the serpent to be literal baby serpents in the future? And they said, no, we don't think that's what we're looking for. And I said, no, we're not. What we're looking for isn't little baby future serpents that are going to cause a problem. What we're looking for are future sins causing um, a problem down, down the line. So the seed of the serpent is really code for future sins, you might say um, human nature. Um, in terms of the woman, well, we know who the woman was, it, it's Eve. And in terms of the seed of the woman, a descendant of the woman, um, we're clearly being told there's going to be a future son that was going to come along. And what God's saying is that there's going to be friction or enmity between the future sins that come along and this future son in other words it's almost like a battle that goes on between a future son and uh, future sins or human nature and what god is telling us almost in in symbolic code form in the in genesis 3 15 is that the future son of eve is going to fatally wound or bruise the head of the serpent which is sin so there's, there is some sort of um, fight, if you, if you want to call it that, going on between a future son of Eve. And, and, and what we obviously understand is that if you, if you whack somebody on the head to cause a bruise, then that can be fatal. Um, and in fact, sin, we're told, is going to bruise the future son's heel. In other words, 
uh, sin in a, in a sense is going to cause some pain to this future son of Eve. Um, and what we're going to find out, of course, and as we know, this is the temporary pain of sacrifice. So remember talking about the fig wasp, going back to that, that, we, we, you know, we were saying that there's some key things that we're looking for here, the promise of seeds, we're looking for uh, sacrifice, wounding, all of those things were happening inside the fig. And we've got very similar themes here in Genesis 3.15. Now, what I found was a really, I think this is a brilliant image. I don't know what you think to this, that sums up Genesis 3.15 really, really well. Because as you can see there on the left, you've got the legs of Jesus Christ on the cross with the, uh, the nail that's going through his feet. But of course, it's the nail also is going through the snake. Now, we know there wasn't a snake when Jesus was uh, crucified it's a symbolic thing but you notice that the way they're depicting this is that the nail's gone through his feet and has gone through the head of the serpent and I think this is a really good way of understanding Genesis 3 15. In fact uh, all the evidence from crucifixion is that the nail would have come out through the back of the heel of the Lord Jesus Christ and actually there's a whole talk I listened to on this about how it would have burst apart the Achilles heel, uh, the tendon at the back of your heel, which is one of the most very painful things that the body can endure, is the, is the complete rupturing and tearing of that. Um, so really, when God said that sin would bruise uh, the heel of the Lord Jesus Christ, if, if effectively that's exactly what happened, because, because Jesus had human nature, he did have to die um, and therefore sin did cause him that that um, literally that that terrible pain. However, I said to the children, you know, how was it that Jesus defeated sin just by dying? Because how does that defeat sin by dying? And they correctly said, well, it's because he overcame sin. He, he didn't let sin win. And I said, Sin only wins if we if we sort of, um, you know, let's sin only wins if we let the temptation overcome us. And Jesus didn't once let the temptation overcome him. And that's how he defeated sin. He didn't give in to it. Um, that's right. Sin only wins if we give in to sin. That's what I said. And in fact, look, talking about his sacrifice, it says he was bruised for our iniquities. It pre pleased the Lord to bruise him, to make him an offering for sin. And um, because of that, he will see his seed in Isaiah 53, verse 5 and verse 10. So again, it seemed to me that in Genesis 3, we've got all these sort of references to wounding, to bruising, uh, to sacrifice all sort of there pretty clearly in Genesis 3 15 and in the whole chapter effectively um, the other bit that was interesting of course in Genesis chapter 3 is that there was only one way into the garden and that way ultimately was protected by the cherubim um, so in Genesis 3 verse 24, so he, God, drove out the man and placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and the flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way to the tree of life. So if you go back to those key phrases that I was um, talking about earlier and bearing in mind, I just got these videos from just, you know, sort of videos are just about the, the fig and how the fig got pollinated we've got an enclosed garden only one very narrow way in the phrase ultimate sacrifice was used wounded and weak was used devotion to pollination was used the promise of seeds and the future being secured because of the work of this tiny insignificant little insect called the fig wasp so I'm just going to play again that video that I played earlier just to remind you of these words and listen to it again. It's exactly the same video, but listen to the words just so you, you know that I'm sort of not making these things up. 
And so the pollen-laden wasp reaches an immature fig. But her journey is far from over. Ahead lies the greatest challenge of her brief life. Clawing and squeezing her way through the gate, her wings and antenna are ripped from her. She makes the ultimate sacrifice as the final push to enter bursts her abdomen. In an epic struggle between sacrifice and survival, the mother wasp crawls through the narrow labyrinth towards the inner chamber. She is wounded and weak, carrying only her eggs and the pollen gift from the former fig. If the wasp fails to pollinate the flowers, no seeds will ever develop. Fig fruits with no future are costly to the tree, so they will not receive an inflow of nutrients. If the wasp does not pollinate, the entire fig may be aborted. However, if she devotes herself to pollination as well as laying eggs, she ensures the fig will hold the promise of seeds. The tree will pump sugars and nutrients into the fig, securing the future of seeds and larvae alike. When they mature and leave, the fig will ripen, thus completing the cycle of mutual So there, benefit. hopefully you heard all of those phrases. So I now come back to the Garden of Eden, and something struck me as I was staring at this picture, because of course in the centre of the garden was the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and it suddenly occurred to me that this tree of knowledge of good and evil, I actually now truly, truly believe is a fig tree and I'm going to prove to you as best as I can that without any I've put question marks there because they were question marks to start with but I'm going to do my best in the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes to prove to you beyond all reasonable doubt that the tree of knowledge of good and evil itself was the fig tree a fig tree just a normal fig tree like we've got fig trees right now so we've got a huge clue that it was the fig tree that God gives us in the fact that, of course, as soon as they ate from the fruit, their eyes were opened. And God doesn't say, by the way, that they, they, they went and found the fig tree and took its leaves, you notice. It just says that they sowed fig leaves. And, and um, reading some stuff from some uh, rabbis on this subject, they say from a Hebraic point of view, uh, God would have mentioned the fact that they had gone to another tree because the last tree that was spoken of was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the way Hebrew works is that you wouldn't then necessarily just say they've taken fig leaves without it automatically as potentially associating itself back to the tree that had just previously been mentioned. The way Hebrew would normally work, and even in our language, you would say, there's the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and they went and found the fig tree and, and, and took the leaves thereof or something like that. But it doesn't do that. And it's almost a clue, therefore. I mean, you imagine, right? Adam and Eve have just eaten of uh, the fruit and they saw they were naked. Do we honestly imagine that they're then going to start walking around as ashamed as they are looking for a tree to cover themselves with leaves? And the answer is, well, they wouldn't. In fact, the leaves of the fig tree are very rough and very coarse, and they're probably the last leaves that you would normally pick to rub against your skin. They're very unpleasant to the touch. And it's far more likely, therefore, that the very first thing that they did was grab the leaves that were right next to them. And I don't think there were lots of other trees very close by. I think that, the, the, you know, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which were in the centre of the garden, would have been distinguishable and not just in like a forest and, and, and so on, sort of packed together with other trees. So it's, it's almost unbelievable to think that they wandered around the garden to try and find some very rough, coarse leaves to try and stitch together. It seems much more likely that they did do exactly that. Now, supposing, therefore, the fig tree is the tree of knowledge of good and evil, suddenly this makes this whole wasp situation pretty astounding. Because if the fig was the forbidden fruit, effectively, then they both ate from it, didn't they? They both ate of the, the, the fig. That means, of course, they were eating a fruit that had got every single part of symbology for salvation built into it. Jesus, as we know, is the one and only way that we can be saved. Jesus was wounded terribly. 
just like the fig wasp was wounded. Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice, just as the fig wasp offers itself as a sacrifice. Jesus devoted himself uh, to God, just as the fig wasp, we're told, is devoted to this one cause. They don't live another life, you know. The fig wasp doesn't have a, a lovely time uh, flying around. It just goes straight and does this one sole purpose. Jesus um, created... Uh, of course, future seeds. He guaranteed future seeds by his work. And Jesus, thereby, through his work, just as the fig was guaranteed the future of the fruit, so Jesus has guaranteed us a, a future life as well. And what was blowing my mind as I was doing this was thinking the very thing that God had got as a test for them had got the solution to their problem if they failed. I mean, how amazing is that? The very symbolic solution for them, if they failed the test, which God, of course, knew they would, was actually planned in the very fruit that they were eating. I mean, I, I just find that utterly, utterly astounding. And... To be honest, so did the kids. I've been uh, inundated with um, emails from, from the kids after this saying it's just amazing. Now, here's another thing, because I then started thinking, if this is true, surely there's going to be some references in the Bible to it. And look at this, right? So I'm saying to you, the tree of knowledge of good and evil is a fig tree. And lo and behold, in Jeremiah chapter 24, verses 2 and 3, which are words that we know well, it says, talking about figs, that one basket had very good figs, even like figs that are first ripe, and the other basket had very naughty figs. And that word naughty is exactly the same word as evil for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And these evil figs were so bad uh, that they couldn't be eaten. They were so evil. They could not be eaten because they were so evil. Then the Lord said unto me, uh, what seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, figs, the good figs, very good, and the evil, very evil, that they cannot be eaten. They are so evil. So here we've got um, a clear reference to figs being related to good and evil, which is exactly the point of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There's good figs and evil figs. So then I started wondering, well, what makes a fig evil? You know, I can understand eating a nice fig, but what makes an evil fig? And this also gets extremely interesting because what I haven't told you so far is that there are two types of figs. There is a female fig, and a male fig, and this also is very, very, very unusual in, in, in the fruit world. There's male figs and female figs, and we cannot eat male figs. All male figs are inedible. You can't eat them. And what the reason is, is that when a fig wasp goes into a male fig, it is able to lay its own eggs inside that inside a male fig when it goes inside a female fig it cannot lay its eggs now the problem of um, a fig wasp laying its own eggs inside a male fig is as follows watch the screen and watch this uh, fig and what's inside it See that? Well, you ain't going to want to eat that. I don't mind eating one dissolved fig, uh, uh, fig wasp, but I don't want to eat that. So all male figs are inedible, and I and these are evil figs. We can't eat them. They're no good for us. They're not tasty uh, at all, and. The other type of evil fig are unpollinated female figs because some um, figs grow and they're not pollinated. And um, if, the, if the fig is not pollinated by the fig wasp, 
as you saw in the video, the tree stops feeding that individual fig. It cuts off uh, nutrition. And because it cuts off nutrition, then it falls to the ground and it goes rotten. So unpollinated female figs are also, I would suggest, evil in God's language. The other point is as well that if you if you leave figs too long, they actually are only fresh for seven days. Uh, after seven days, you can't eat them. They go off. They, 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 they rot. And that's why you rarely you do see figs in in supermarkets, but they're very, very expensive because the shelf life is very, very uh, small. So I'm just going to play you another quick video here, which sort of, again, encapsulates a lot of the things that we've been talking about. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lauren, and this is Brain Stuff. Imagine for a minute that you're a pregnant woman. Still with me, guys? Okay, now in this scenario, the only way you can give birth is if you crawl into a small cave made out of chocolate. And the tunnel to this cave is so cramped that the only way you can get through is by cutting off your own arms 127 hours style. But once you're in this cave, then you can actually give birth and then die from either exhaustion or starvation. Now, this all sounds pretty grim, as if giving birth wasn't difficult enough, but what I just described is the life cycle of the fig wasp. Their role in the pollination of figs is crucial, both to the propagation of their species and to the survival of the fig trees. This arrangement between wasp and plant is called mutualism, so you wouldn't have figs and vice versa. And yes, this means that most of the figs we eat contain at least one dead wasp. But more on that later. First, let's talk about pollination. The fig is technically just a flower with its petals folded inside. Now there are male figs, which are inedible and called capra figs, and female figs, which are the ones that we eat. But in order to create seeds and tasty, tasty fruit, the female figs need to receive some pollen from the male figs. Since the figs' reproductive bits are tucked away inside, though, wind and bees can't help the way that they do with lots of other plants. Enter the fig wasp. For a dude fig plant to share its pollen with a lady fig plant, a female fig wasp needs to enter a male fig. She crawls through a narrow passage in the fig called the osteole. It's so cramped that her wings and antenna break off along the way. But the messed up thing here is that the lady fig wasp doesn't know whether she's entering a male cat fig or a female fig. If it is in fact a capra fig, she'll find its male flower parts perfectly shaped for her to lay her eggs into. The eggs hatch into larvae and grow within the fig's petals. The male wasps hatch first and are born blind and flightless. They mate with their female counterparts, which yeah, I guess they are technically brothers and sisters. Wasps are basically all Targaryens, it's fine. And the male wasps will start eating and exit tunnel through the fig. Uh, they can't escape though, so they die inside. But the females collect the fig's pollen, crawl out of the tunnel that their brothers created, and fly away in search of a new fig plant to lay their own eggs in. But if a female wasp enters a female fig, she won't be able to lay her eggs because of this long part of the flower called the stylus. She'll probably die of loneliness and exhaustion, but at least she's delivered the pollen, yeah? And hey, good news for us, an enzyme inside the fig called ficin breaks down her corpse into protein, so it just ingests the dead wasp and makes it part of the delicious ripened fruit for us to eat. Just so we're clear, those crunchy bits you're chewing in figs are not bits of dead wasp or larva. They really are the fig's seeds. And anyway, you should probably get used to the idea of occasionally eating an insect by accident. The FDA considers certain amounts of insect content in various foods natural and unavoidable. And it's really not hazardous, just gross. So there we go. Right. Last couple of slides. So imagine the tree of knowledge of good and evil is a, fig tree, uh, is a fig tree and on that fig tree there are female figs which are good and there are male figs that are evil, right? And I've depicted them there as green and black, hopefully you can see that. And the point is that it's only the female ones that are the ones that are good, they're the ones that you can finally eat and are good for you, right? Now what we're saying therefore is that the fig wasp is going to go in to a female fig so that we are then able to eat it because it's pollinated it. 
And the other point, therefore, is that if Jesus is symbolic of the fig wasp going into the good fruit, I said to the children at the youth weekend, why is it that it's a female fig that's good and uh, a male fig that is bad? And amazingly, between them all, they worked out the answer. And the answer is, quite simply, that if you think about it, Jesus is coming as the bridegroom to marry the bride. And therefore, we are symbolic of females. All of us are symbolic of females because we're symbolic of the bride. And it's only the female fruit that was good on this tree. And of course, as we've already said, there can be fruit on the tree that is female, but is never pollinated by the fig wasp. And those fruit lose the nutrients and drop to the ground. So some female figs also become uh, evil because they haven't let Christ effectively into their lives. It's only the sacrifice of Jesus into our lives that turns us into a fruit that is edible and a fruit that is good to eat. Now, the last couple of points I just wanted to make was this, because what your mind I know is saying is, well, surely to goodness, it can't be the fig, because it says that when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired, and is the fig tree any of those things? You know, if I look at that fig, um, well, good for food surely means something that is bountiful with lots and lots and lots and lots of uh, food. And surely there are other fruit varieties out there that look much better for food. And surely if it's pleasant to the eyes, it's sort of OK. But it's there's other fruit that's a lot more pleasant to the eyes than than the fig. And in terms of a tree to be desired, well, it's sort of OK, but it's there's there's trees that are far, far better and bigger and grander than ever the fig tree is. But you know something to me, this actually makes even more of a case for it being the fig tree than anything else, because God hasn't over engineered the temptation. He hasn't made something in the center of the garden with fruit almost to die for, something that was spectacularly different and, and better than all the other fruits and a tree that was bigger and grander and, um, and, and all the rest of it. God almost downplayed the tree in the middle of the garden. The fig tree was made to look slightly not uh, uh, a tree to be tempted by. In fact, God gave them every other fruit that he'd made look probably even better than the fig tree. But as with all things, uh, brothers and sisters, the problem is this, that if we're told that we can't have something, to us it looks like a delicious cake, whatever it is. Isn't that true? God says you can't have that. Well, it then becomes the one thing that we do want. And they looked at this fig tree and thought, well, why can't I eat that? And look at that fruit. It is interesting. And look at the tree and look at the leaves. And why can't I eat it? And then the serpent gets involved and suddenly we've got a problem. And maybe, you know, a lot of people don't give a fig about figs. But my study of this, and this is only the beginning because of course it goes on and on and on from here and the other two talks do. But suddenly perhaps we should give a fig about the fig because the fig is the plan and purpose of God at the very, very beginning on the tree at the very, very beginning and became in fact the test. And in the, in the, in the, in the subsequent talk, it shows how the fig tree became symbolic of Israel and Israel became the exact same test that they had in the garden as well. And that, to me, also became even more incredible. So the key lessons um, that, that, that I think we take personally from this, perhaps, is, I mean, one is just how amazing is God to have designed the solution in the very thing that was causing them to, uh, to, to sin. But we are also tempted to do wrong, like um, Adam and Eve. And we um, succumb to sin when we do the wrong thing and um, deserve death because of it, exactly like Adam and Eve. 
But if we accept Christ into our lives, then we can be saved. We have to let that fig wasp effectively into our lives. Otherwise, we lose all of the goodness from the tree, which is supplying energy to the fruit, and we will ultimately die. Um, Christ's willing sacrifice enables us to survive, i.e. to be forgiven. He turns us into something sweet and wonderful uh, for God. God in turn strengthens us and gives us all we need. The tree is pumping uh, lots and lots of goodness in, into the fruit uh, for those that have let the fig wasp in effectively let jesus into their lives and look ultimately as we know we are going to be it will almost go full cycle won't it that actually one day we will live in a new garden of eden uh, on this earth but the ultimate garden of eden won't have a test that we can fail the test has been overcome by the fig wasp in other words the lord jesus christ and his sacrifice and that was the end of the first talk. The second talk is all about how it is that the fig tree itself became symbolic of Israel. And all of a sudden, many, many passages tie up uh, with that when you link Israel to the tree of knowledge of good and 